All right. Um, today we're going to get more in detail with animation. Uh, before we do that, before we actually look at some code, I want to talk about two key concepts dealing with animation. And first is the notion of a timeline. All right. Timeline and animation would be, if you think about how they did animation in the old days, they would take, um, you know, a drawing and snap a photo of it. Then they would take another drawing where it was slightly different, and snap a picture of it, and so on down the line. I mean, that's how they did all the old cartoons. And like the, the stop motion, like claymation animations that I loved as a kid, you know. Pardon me? Gumby and Pokey. Well, Gumby and Pokey. I was thinking more like Jason and the Argonauts. Uh, or, or more recently, if anyone's seen the, and I love this movie, The Fantastic Mr. Fox. That is a great movie, and it's done with stop motion. But again, it's tedious. I mean, they literally have to line up. They have these dolls. And, <laughs> and you, you know, they move them slightly, take a picture, move them slightly. And they would do that with drawings. And if you do some math, um, let's see, um, a traditional cartoon would be like 12 frames per second, I think. If it was transferred to 35 or 16 millimeter film, it would have been 24 frames per second for a sound movie. Okay, is that a movie or an animated? Well, it had to be on film. Right. So, and they didn't have videotape. Right, when they first started doing cartoons. No, I understand. So that. it was all on 24, uh, so for in the theater, it had to be 35 millimeter film. Right. Half frame, 35 millimeter film. That. And that was 24 frames per second. Well, the film could be, but that doesn't mean that there were 24 different frames. It could have, they, in other words, they could have doubled up on each one. They wouldn't do that. They wouldn't? No. It would be, it would, 12 frames per second would be too choppy. No matter right. what. Yeah, we're Googling this. For a second, yeah. I was a photo technician in the Air Force. Yeah. Four years ago. Okay. <laughs> I I I should have known better. Generated pretty quick, <laughs> and, I, and, and it's like, and, and by the way, I'm like in Drug Mart like I know, I six times a week, I think, you know, just because it's so close, and I like, and not is either there or Giant Eagle, and usually if there's a bunch of things Giant Eagle, if there's just a few things Drug Mart, so you know, you probably see me like in sweats and you know, <laughs> still in my pajamas. We went to, me and my daughter went to Giant Eagle last night in pajamas. I felt like such a slob, but it's like, I don't feel like getting dressed again. <laughs> it happens. You wouldn't believe how long the process was 40 years ago. Oh, my God. Three days. I innovated same-day processing in Cleveland. Same-day processing and printing. I was the first one to do it commercially. Okay, so 24 <laughs> frames per second. All right. So how many seconds in a minute? 60. Got one right today, anyhow. So how many frames would that be in a minute? That would be 0, 0, 4, 2, 6 times 4, 4, 2, 2. It's like 1,400. He's a web developer, not a man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think I think that's right. 1400? 1440. 1440. So let's talk about a 15-minute SpongeBob cartoon. 
or Bugs Bunny cartoon, because that might have been done that way. Let's better yet, let's talk about a 10 minute one. That way I don't have to be a mathematician. 14,000 frames for a 10 minute Bugs Bunny cartoon. That's crazy. Of course they would, I'll say the word cheat, even though it's not really cheating a bit. Because if Bugs was walking across the forest and there was a tree here and a tree here, they wouldn't have to draw. Let's say Bugs was, was taken, uh, uh, walking across and taking, a, you know, taking 10 seconds to walk across the screen. They wouldn't have to draw the background 10 times. They could take and just do very similar to what they do with what you can do with like Photoshop or GIMP and use layers. So in other words, they could take and have bugs and move bugs across, snap a picture, move them a little bit, snap a picture. And if he's walking, really, they don't need a distinct frame for every step. They might have two or three, one with the left foot forward, one with the right foot forward. So they can like get away from like having to draw 14,000 complete sketches, but still, <laughs> That's a lot of work, very tedious. All right. The timeline. So far, there was a there was a camera technician that took the picture. Had to take fourteen thousand pictures. Four hundred. Right. For every. Right. Exactly. A timeline is sort of what's going to happen frame by frame. All right. So I mean, you have a timeline whether you're talking about computer animation or not. So frame by frame. And again, you can have layers. So you could have the background layer of the tree, and then bugs over here, background layer of the tree, bugs over here, and so on going across the screen, completing the path. So that's what we mean by timeline. And again, it would be related to you know, how long each frame is. And typically 24 frames per second, and we'd go from there. So that's what I mean when I talk about a timeline. It's like a frame by frame thing. And the idea is, is at that rate, it creates the illusion of motion, all right? Because, you know, it, it looks like it's moving because it essentially fools your eye into not seeing discrete images, but seeing a, a thing move. And we've all had experience with flip books and all that, so we, we know how that works. So we still have a notion of a timeline, all right? as a series of things that are going to happen one after another. Now those things are going to be very different when we talk about computer animation, all right, for a number of reasons. And again, we're going to start off with some very basic sort of animations. We're not going to do a SpongeBob cartoon today or anything. But we're going to do some very basic animations, but that still could be useful on a website, all right. And we'll have some timelines involved. Now, the big advantage of computer animation compared to regular animation is if there's a pattern, the computer can fill in frames between the starting and ending. For example, let's say I was doing in my cartoon, I wanted to show a baseball coming closer and closer and closer until it filled up the screen. If I was doing that, I'd have to draw a little baseball, a little bit bigger baseball, a little bit bigger, and so on until finally it hit the screen. That's a very regular pattern, right? I mean, that's something that is just, you know, I mean, that's very regular. It gets a little bit bigger each time. With a computer, you can generate, you can create what are called keyframes on my timeline. So maybe starts out like that, ends like that. These are the two key frames. These are the two frames that me as a developer specifies and we let the tool figure out everything between here and here. So the computer will gen generate it getting progressively bigger until it's the size we want. Now, this sort of animation, they shorten it because it's simply too long of a word between, and they call these tweens. So if you talk about a tween animation, that relates to letting 
the software generate the frames between two keyframes that you've defined. So these are important concepts, timeline and tweens. Now, I would really spend some time debating in my own head how to cover this material. Because we don't have tons of time to talk about animation, and animation can be very difficult. All right? Previously, we did flash animation in this class. And if anyone is still interested, we could probably, you know, during your special project time, uh, which is coming up, you could, you could probably uh, run some flash, and I could work with you to do that. But things are moving towards achieving animation through our standard, uh, through what are called web standards, our standard stuff for web pages, our standard languages for web pages. And that is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And specifically, HTML5 offers a lot more um, extensive sort of animation tools. Problem is, again, it's complicated. All right? So I did, when, I did what I try to do when I'm, all, when I'm always faced with a complicated task. I try to cheat. All right? What's the way to cheat in this case? The way to cheat in this case is we're going to use a framework. All right? What's a framework? Can anyone define a, a framework within the context of software development? Foundation. A foundation. It's a good way to put it. All right. It's a starting point, if you will. Uh, foundation is a good, very good word, because when you think of foundation, it's something that you can build on. In other words, someone has already done some of the work for you when you use a framework. And that's good. That's good because then you can focus on the part of the job that you really need to work on. All right. If someone handles the, 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 the very basics of something, then you can really devote your time to the parts of your project that are really complicated and really challenging, that really requires your efforts, because someone handled all the easy stuff for you. you know? Think of like if you're cooking. right? We talk about making a cake from scratch. You don't make cakes from scratch, right? You don't grow the wheat yourself. All right, and grind it into flour or whatever. You're not really making it from scratch. You're starting off at a starting point. All right, that is, you're starting off. You're buying the ingredients that are ready for you, and then you go and you make it. Um, now, I guess for baking, there's all kinds of frameworks you could use. Right? You could use the framework of buying a completed pie at Drug Mart and just spraying a little cream on it. All right? <laughs> that's using something that's pretty much pre-built, and you're just maybe tapping your signature on it and, and maybe adding just a bit to it. Or you could buy a mix and make it that way. Or you could buy the ingredients and make it from scratch. But in all of those, you're doing a different starting point. Now, if you think about it, you know, which are you going to do? Well, depends on the situation. You know, no one's going to argue that a skilled baker baking something from scratch is going to make something that's probably amazing. It's going to make better than anything you could buy in a store or get in a box. But you know what? You know, I've had Mama Joe's pies, and they're pretty darn good. All right? And I've known people that, uh, you know, that, that have bought a mix and made things, and they hit the spot. So it's always sort of a cost-benefit analysis. You might be able to get exactly what you want if you make it from scratch. Um, but more time, more effort, and likely more expense. All right? Using a frame, and I guess my point is, is pretty much no matter how you're developing this, you're using some sort of framework. It's just a matter of using a framework that does a lot for you or using a framework that does a little bit for you. So I did a lot of research and looked for tools and looked for kinds of things. I found a framework that I want to use because it seems pretty easy enough to use, at least with a little practice. And it's called the GreenSock framework. And GreenSock is used both for Flash animation and for JavaScript. Apparently, it's a framework that is used a lot in Flash. Uh, and they're, they're developing a, a version of it, uh, a JavaScript version of it, as more animation is going towards 
the standard space, HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript as opposed to Flash. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull down a couple examples. And we're adding to this mix. myself, but I think the 12 frames per second might have been a default in Flash, and that may be where I got it from. That might be. And I know, don't make excuses. <laughs> All right, let's pull these up. Now, although these are simple animations, I think they're animations that could be potentially beneficial. Now, do keep in mind, again, these are not extensive animations. These are things that are literally bringing our page to life and creating some motion, some animated effects, but hopefully animated effects that are actually beneficial. So let's go and break this down. I posted in the lecture folder, I posted my examples. I was working on after I got home from Giant Eagle. I have two of these examples. We'll look at them, and then we'll look at the behavior of them and how they work. I can get rid of that, and I can get rid of that. Okay. Here's the first one where I have some thumbnails. That when I click on, the image gets bigger. When I click off of it, the image gets smaller. Interesting thing with this is, other than the fact that these should be lined up in a single column, this functionality is working even though IE8 and earlier doesn't support HTML5. So whatever this is doing, whatever is going on deep inside there is not like an HTML5 thing, which is a different sort of animation. So I think you can see how this could be useful. 
out of sight. You have, again, maybe with some rearrangement or, or something like that. But again, you basically have a grid of thumbnails that if the user clicks on, they get a bigger version of it. So if I run this on uh, Internet uh, 9? Oh, it should still work. So this JavaScript, this is not, uh, is it within the framework of HTML5? No, that's what I'm saying. Oh. It's, it's not in the framework of HTML5. Oh, okay. All right. So that's one of the animations. Again, you can see how that is, could be potentially effective to have something like a photo essay or something like that where people could expand it. The other one that I have is a little rotating slideshow that it does not work very well in IE. Let's try opening this guy in Firefox. Why is the main screen? Aaron Cripton. I just looked that up. Oh. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Why or what? Your file font color, font color is green on the Explorer. Oh, really? Interesting. Here's a nice little slideshow that runs an animation that shifts between that. You see these on an awful lot of sites. Every college in the world has one of these on their homepage, I think, just showing a montage of, of different scenes. And I did this with images. We could actually do this with more than images if we, if we wanted to. We could do this actually with blocks of code that, that uh, contain text as well. All right, let's look at the magic and how that is happening in these two different examples. Let's look at this one first. First of all, this is based on the example I did before with the, with the CSS, I'm using the same CSS and so on. But notice I'm using this. This is the green sock framework. By putting this in, this is a statement that says, bring in this JavaScript library into my web page. So let my web page take advantage of the features of this library. So there's instructions, there's code, and all that. Now the nice thing is, is I don't even need to like download this. I could download it to my server, but I can actually just access it off of their site if I want to. Right. So if their site ever went down, it crashes your site, though. Yep. No, Cloudflare don't go down. Okay. <laughs> well, that's the whole idea behind Cloudflare. Okay. Actually, and let's take a second to look at the Green Sock framework. There's actually, this is another reason I liked it, by the way. There's actually four different classes, four different pieces of functionality. And if you notice, there's a light and a max for each of them. All right? There's a tween light and a tween max, and a timeline light and a timeline max. These correspond to the two kinds of functionality that I described before, tweens and timelines. So the tween class allows us to do simple tweens. The time class, the timeline class allows us to define a timeline, a series of events that we want to have happen. Although I haven't dug in these in great detail, it seems pretty obvious that the light is a simpler but less functionality version, and the max is the higher end a more functionality version. All right? So, easy way to do it, harder way to do it. It's nice when a tool offers you that options, uh, that option, right? Because some things that, you know, it, it, it tends to go that the more 
functionality that a tool provides, the more complicated it's going to be to use. I mean, it's just the, the nature of the beast. Question? Yes, if I had a series of, let's say, drawings that I made, uh, uh -huh. that I came up with on Photoshop or right. whatever, uh, and I needed to sequence them, but not in a specific, the, the, the amount of time in between the different frames would vary widely. Mm -hmm. Um, probably timeline light would do that. Timeline light, you, you specify a duration for each event on your timeline. Okay. So you could do that with, with timeline light. And I can take a specific drawing. You should be able to, yeah. Okay. All right. So, what I've done on each of these, this is again the thumbnail one that expands. I've put in an event that says on click. On click, what that does is that initiates JavaScript when the user clicks on the particular element. There's a whole list of events that you can write code for. They're the typical kinds of things that the users are going to interact with your page. What do users do to stuff? They click on stuff, they put their mouse on stuff. All right? So therefore, I can say on click, All right. Or I could say maybe on mouse over if I want to do something when the mouse went over something or whatever. But these are a set of predefined events where you can write code. And in this case, I'm doing the on click. What is in the quotes? Within the quotes is my JavaScript function that, that I'm going to call. Now, this is a function that I wrote. Okay. This is a function that I wrote. It uses the GreenSock framework, but this specific expand function I wrote. Now notice how all three of these lines say the same. They say expand this. This is a nice little shorthand that says whatever this function is going to do, I want to do it to the thing that I clicked on. That saves me from having to write three different functions. One function to make the squirrel bigger, one function to make the sign bigger, one function will make the trees bigger. I can simply write one generic function that says, okay, ex do whatever you're going to do, do it to the photo that I clicked on. So that's what expand this means. Let's look at that expand function. Whatever photo I clicked on gets stored in this variable, this argument that's called photo. I then have a very simple if statement that checks to see if checks to see the size of the image. If the image is small, I'm going to make it big. If the image is big, I'm going to make it small. So the thumbnail for the image, I've defined in my CSS to be 200 pixels wide. So if I look at the CSS here, for this guy. I've made all my images 200 pixels wide. The images are actually 600 pixels big though, but through my style sheet, since my style sheet can control everything about the appearance, I can make the image appear smaller. Notice how I don't have to say width and height. It's smart enough that if I just supply one of the parameters, it like figures out what the other parameters should be. In this case, these are these are these images are square, so the the length matches the, the the width, or the height matches the width. So, but but still, it's a nice feature to have. So what is? Let's go back to looking at this function. Again, I'm calling this function with an argument, which is always going to be the photo that I've clicked on. So this little variable, these are called variables or arguments is going to contain a reference. It's going to be pointing at the image that I clicked on. I can then ask, is the photo width equal to 200? In other words, is the photo in its thumbnail state? If it is, then I'm going to execute this command. If it's not, that means it's in its expanded state, I'm going to execute this command. Let's see what this command does. I'm 